Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Taylor smith Hams. I am an organizer with 350.org's US team. And for folks who are not familiar with 350, we are a global organization dedicated to ending our dependence on fossil fuels by ushering in a fast and just transition to renewable energy. If everyone could just stay on mute, that would be really great so that we can make sure we can all hear the presenters today. You can use the chat um, throughout the event. And so 350.org, we have about 160 staff who work around the world in 40 countries, and there are about 500 350.org affiliated local groups around the world. And these groups are all independent from 350.org, and our U.S. team and our other regional teams, um, we all work to provide support and training and help make connections to strengthen the organizing of these affiliated groups. And we will drop a link in the chat so you can see a map of all of the 350 affiliated groups in your community. Thank you, Deb, for just dropping that in there. And feel free to reach out to me also if you would like any help making connections to 350 affiliates in your area. So a little bit about why we are here today. In January, 350's US team hosted a webinar about militarism and the climate crisis. We had really incredible group of speakers and we had almost 800 people register for that event. And a lot of folks reached out afterwards wanting to do more collaborative work at this nexus of militarism and the climate crisis. And one of the first groups that reached out was Veterans for Peace and um, gave us more information about their climate crisis and militarism project. And as part of that project, Veterans for Peace offers presentations to all kinds of groups. And so we thought that it would be really great to host a virtual event for a wider audience so that we could all get to hear from Veterans for Peace and also hone in on one specific tactic that they encourage climate groups in particular to join them in, which is protesting military air shows. So we're really excited to learn more from Veterans for Peace today about how militarism and war are key drivers of the climate crisis and how climate peace and other organizers can take action together. So today we will hear from three members of Veterans for Peace, James Jenko is a member of the Albuquerque chapter of Veterans for Peace and also of VFP's Climate Crisis and Militarism Project. He was an infantry medic in the Vietnam War in 1970. And after his time in the war, he studied ecology at UC Berkeley and received a BS in conservation of natural resources. Gary Butterfield was drafted into the US Army during the Vietnam War and then declared as a conscientious objector and opposed the war while in the military. He is past president of the San Diego chapter of Veterans for Peace and a member of VFP's Climate Crisis and Militarism Project. And he's also a member of San Diego 350 and is keenly interested in the effects of militarism on the climate crisis. And lastly, Janet Wheel, a lifetime associate member of Veterans for Peace and a military family member, serves on the Climate Crisis and Militarism Project a former Code Pink national staffer and a longtime peace advocate. Janet has also been active in the Extinction Rebellion movement. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna hand it off to Jim to get us started. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much, Taylor, uh, <clears throat> for the introductions. We're very grateful to be here with all of you today. Now, I've been an environmentalist for a very long time. I'll tell you about the part of my story that relates to our discussion today. I was drafted into the Vietnam War, which the Vietnamese call the American War. And after my training, I was assigned to be a medic in an infantry battalion commanded by Colonel George Armstrong Custer III. Um, as a platoon medic, I witnessed, besides the human carnage, immense destruction to the earth. My unit operated in areas where resistance forces often disappeared into tunnels. So if we couldn't find the Vietnamese, our so-called enemy, 
we called in the Air Force to destroy all that concealed or sustained the enemy. Planes bombed rice paddies, forests, fields, rivers, sometimes villages, and defoliated huge tracts of land with Agent Orange. It didn't take long for me to realize we're fighting the earth, we're fighting the whole Vietnamese earth. If we couldn't find the Vietnamese, we could, and we did, destroy their land. So after my time in the war, as a response, I became an environmentalist, studied at UC Berkeley, in one class, ecosystemology is worth a brief mention this morning. For a final exam, students were told to go out onto the campus and each of us had to choose one square inch to write about as an ecosystem, one inch of land. Uh, that is to write about the relationships between organisms, about what sustained this little patch of earth. I remembered as I was writing that a Cobra gunship, an attack helicopter that I saw a lot of in Vietnam, was designed to put a bullet in every square inch of a football field in less than one minute. And at the same time in Berkeley, far from the war, I was amazed by the complexity of life in minuscule, this one inch, which was part of and sustained by everything around it, inseparable. Aldo Leopold, a great ecologist wrote that land as a community is the basic concept of ecology, but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. And Max Liberon, an indigenous scientist, deepens this insight. He defines land, he writes it as a capital L, he defines land as the unique entity that is the combined living spirit of plants, animals, humans, histories, and events. Now, if we can take that in, just imagine what our relationship with this earth would be and our relationship with each other. I'll give you one more quote, and this is from Jack Forbes of the Powhatan Lenape peoples of Delaware. He wrote, I can lose my hands and still live. I can lose my legs and still live. I can lose my eyes and still live. But if I lose the air, I die. If I lose the earth, I die. If I lose the water, I die. If I lose the plants and animals, I die. All of these things, are more a part of me, more essential to my every breath than is my so-called body. What is my real body? Well, Jack Forbes is referring to this whole wide earth that sustains us all, every species. And I hope this quote will provide a kind of circle to contain our discussion today. Thank you, I'm gonna pass the baton to my friend, uh, Gary Butterfield. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim, for those moving remarks. Uh, am I coming through clearly enough? Does everything look good, Taylor? You look great. Yes. Um, th those, those really affect me every time you say those, Jim. And, and as Taylor said, I'm a member of both 350 and San Diego Veterans for Peace. And... Uh, we have a, a young grandson now, and it, one of the reasons I do this is we've got to do a better job of leaving the earth and what we're doing. So uh, thank you all for being here today, and hopefully we can, we can come out of here with a plan to take some action. Uh, as Taylor said, all three of our speakers were members of Veterans for Peace. Briefly, we believe that violence should be the last resort of how humans resolve differences. And we're also members of the Climate Crisis and Militarism Project, which provides public education and an advocacy campaign on the impacts of militarism on the climate crisis. We feel that these issues have been minimized or avoided for many years 
by some of the mainstream environmental and climate organizations. Our work focuses on these four areas, and our slogan is Militarism Fuels Climate Crisis. Now, these two images really serve to connect the dots for me between these two existential threats. On the left, we see, of course, Greta Thunberg, and she's warning us of the urgency of the situation with the climate crisis, urging us to act as if our house is on fire because we know it is. And on the right, we see President Dwight Eisenhower from the 50s, and he warned us early on about the perils of investing too much into militarism, taking away from spending on social programs. We at Veterans for Peace feel that we're uniquely able to connect these dots between these two critical issues. Now, we're gonna share a lot of information with you during this brief time, and most of it can be found on our website, which Janet will drop into the, into the chat and you can certainly follow up afterwards. But we can sum this up in three key points. The US military pollutes a lot. The US military spends money a lot. And you can do something about it. The time for military environmental exceptionalism is over. Now, 350 parts per million. That was a noble goal and a terrific name, but now it really magnifies the severity of the situation. The time to act is now. However, it seems that the two current international wars in Ukraine and Gaza have pushed the looming climate crisis from the front of our consciousness and out of the headlines. So I want to remind you that the U.S. military is the world's single largest institutional consumer of petroleum products, and it's also the most prolific single institutional emitter of greenhouse gases. One institution, one entity, and we don't hear much about that. We haven't in the past because the U.S. government has made sure that this is not something that's focused on. Going back to a major United Nations conference on the environment back in 1997, the United States government lobbied heavily to exempt many military emissions from even being recorded or reported. The U.S. never became a signatory to that agreement, yet those exemptions existed. And even today, military emissions are only voluntarily reported. And of course, with the news and the drumbeat on the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza, there's been a newfound focus at looking at the destruction that's caused by these wars and the environmental damage that occurs as well. Uh, there are lots of estimates out there about what the total millions of tons of carbon dioxide emissions are, and we're still going to see a remaining huge carbon footprint from reconstruction in both of these wars. The impacts of the war in Gaza have produced more CO2 than many individual countries do in a year. Climate and environmental impacts of the war and the war industry are many. Environmental issues include air, water, land pollution, chemical spills, releases of radioactive 
dust at nuclear power plants, damage to hydroelectric plants, pollution of the soil, damage of the Russia Nord Stream pipeline created a huge release of methane. Death comes now for those in the war zone and later for many far away. And of course, there is no such thing as a green war. War and preparation for war are polluting and long lasting. For example, depleted uranium, which is used in tank armor and some munitions, is 40% depleted of its radioactivity, but retains all the toxicity of natural uranium. And even today, more than 50 years after the Vietnam War, children there are still maimed by unexploded ordnance or born with severe birth defects from the transgenerational impact of the defoliant Agent Orange. And it seems we now routinely hear about damage from PFAS, which are man-made forever chemicals, but are a primary component of firefighting foam that military uses to put out jet fuel fires. We now know that there's contamination around many military bases from this. Burn pits are open air sites of solid waste incineration. They've also caused damage to veterans and civilians. And of course, the whole supply chain in, of uranium mining and processing and production of nuclear weapons is fraught with a huge carbon footprint. But military missions are not required to be reported. It's a difficult task. We have estimates now that give us fuel usage and such, but don't forget about all of these other sources of military greenhouse gas emissions, including arms races, which we're all aware of, military contractors, R&D production, the list goes on and on. One of the primary contributors is the fact that the United States has approximately 750 bases throughout the world. These bases range in size from the smallest lily pads that typically provide some pre-positioned weaponry and supplies to huge complexes, including its own housing, hospitals, bowling alleys, golf courses, and power plants. Imagine the supply chains of that. And you'll notice on the map, these bases are clustered in the Mideast to protect the world's fossil fuel supply, the world's oil supplies. We're also seeing bases in Europe and in Asia. I think that the nearest competitor, Russia, has eight bases outside of its own land. And these bases really kind of stem from the early 1900s when the U.S. was flexing its naval power. It sent a fleet of 16 battleships in 1907 to begin a circumnavigation of the globe to demonstrate the war to the world America's naval prowess. Well, those ships required strategically placed refueling ports throughout the world as the Navy expanded its reach and protected U.S. interests. Well, coal gave way to oil, and we still see that type of global penetration. But what does this all cost us? You know, we've looked at the military's pollution, uh, and incidentally, each of the military services is acutely aware of the climate crisis. Uh, they've developed their own climate action plan, if you will, on how to achieve net zero by the year 2050. But until they can come up with synthetic fuels and change their goals, uh, these climate action plans are merely 
some lofty goals with no real plan on how to get there. So this simple pie chart is looking at President Biden's proposed fiscal year 2025 budget for discretionary spending. And the biggest part of this $1.6 trillion goes to military-related expenditures. So you've got nearly $900 billion for the Pentagon, which you think would be the limit of it, but nuclear weapons, which you would think would go with the military, are actually in the energy department. That's another $34 billion. Put in Veterans Affairs and some other smaller items, and you're up to nearly a trillion dollars that we're spending. And most years, we see representatives from both political parties clamor to increase the budget for what the Pentagon even asks for because spending on the military seems to be a jobs program within each congressional district. And incidentally, the Pentagon has failed all six of its audits. So not only does it not spend its money wisely, it doesn't know where it goes. And a good chunk of that money, maybe 40% of it, goes to the big five military contractors. where each of their CEOs makes close to $20 million in annual compensation. So we've got the money, but it's up to us to change the priorities. And I reflect on this quote from Martin Luther King Jr., a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. So when we look at the budget, even with Biden's new climate initiatives, I should put that in quotes, the U.S. spends more than 20 times on the military as it does on climate issues. It also spends nearly 10 times as much on border protection than it does on climate. And that's an important component because many international aid organizations predict that there'll be anywhere from 200 million to as many as a billion climate refugees by the year 2050. And what we see today, countries with the largest historical emissions the USA, the European Union, China, and Russia are countries that today are erecting towering border walls, as we see in the news almost weekly with the southern border with Mexico. But when the American Friends Service Committee commissioned a recent poll by YouGov they determined that 56% of American adults favor cutting the Pentagon budget and redirecting that money to something that would be more beneficial for social welfare. And of course, converting the war economy to a green economy is going to be critical so that we can preserve good paying jobs. Several studies have been con conducted, including one from Brown University's Cost of War Project, that confirm the fact that when a society invests in jobs associated with a green economy, such as renewable energy or higher education or health care, creates a larger return on that investment than on money spent 
for the military. So we've looked at the military's pollution. We've looked at how the military spends money. What can we do about it? It's such uh, an elephant in the room, and it's such a huge entity. Where do we where do we look to have some type of impact and create a conversation about the military's pollution and military spending? Well, in San Diego, about seven years ago, we decided to protest the local Miramar Air Show, which the Navy bills as one of the biggest in the world. Well, we felt that it glorif the air show glorified violence and appealed to kids, uh, teenagers, and kids even younger than that. So we even sent in two of our younger members with a video camera. They developed a short film called Disneyland of War. And in it, we chronicled children as young as 10 years old aiming automatic weapons at each other, being urged on by uniformed service people. Well, we thought that was pretty important, but we really didn't get much community support. Well, three years ago, we changed our focus to only looking at the pollution created by these acrobatic jets, primarily for our entertainment. And uh, we cited statistics such as each time the jets fly, a group of six of these jets use 7,200 gallons of jet fuel per hour, creating nearly 120 metric, ton, metric tons of carbon dioxide, plus the smaller particulates that are emblematic of combustion of fossil fuel. These had an impact. And, you know, as an aside, 10% of these stunt pilots for the Blue Angels and Thunderbirds have died in aircraft crash, crashes since their inception in 1953. Well, lo and behold, when we started talking about how the air show fuels the climate crisis, we were able to tap into something in our local community. So today, we have over 25 local climate, peace, faith, and political groups endorsing our actions against the polluting of the Miramar air show. And you can see here that it, it's really kind of a cross-section. We hope to get more this year. Uh, we find that in giving this presentation to activists, uh, most activists are members of more than one group. So uh, by word of mouth, we get referrals to give this presentation to another group. Maybe it's a sustainability group or a climate justice group. Well, we decided that this is something that we would like to share with everybody else. And in looking at 2024, there are going to be about 65 military air shows scheduled for 2024. And you can find the individual locations and times and websites posted on our own webpage. But let this webinar serve as your introduction into building energy to protest your own local air show and align with like-minded groups. So we've highlighted uh, oh, a dozen or so here where we think or we know there's an opportunity with some type of interest in protesting against the air show and sparking conversations about military pollution and military spending. Well, you say there's not one of these air shows nearby to where I live. Well, the Navy and, and Air Force are really going to make it easier for you because upcoming in mid-May, we're going to see, courtesy of Hollywood, a big budget IMAX film focused on the Blue Angels. So this could provide an opportunity for you 
to get involved in your local community and table and educate people about the perils of this pollution and the wasteful spending. Uh, as an example, last year, and, and I know I saw some of you registered here um, attending this particular webinar, but last year, Seattle 350 and Veterans for Peace, Seattle and Tacoma, and I think Spokane as well, partnered with other groups such as Extinction Rebellion, and they protested their annual seafare event in late summer. And I think they're excited to come back this year even stronger. So when we ask yourselves, what can you do? We're asking you to help us spread the word and amplify our voices. Educate yourselves. Find other opportunities for us to do this and join the No Moss campaign. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Janet. Thanks so much, Gary. And let me say first how delighted I am to see a lot of familiar faces and names on this call and also a lot of new people. This is what we have been working toward for quite a long time to have a coming together of people working on environmental and climate issues and working for peace. Militarism can seem abstract and remote and overwhelming, the everything everywhere all the time that makes war possible. Standing under the roaring jets of a military air show brings it home, literally, to the skies over our communities, to our ears, eyes, bodies. Military air shows are the simulation of their use as weapon systems as we are now seeing so devastatingly in Gaza as Israeli pilots fly F-16s and F-35s to bomb and strafe the land and people of Gaza. This is presented for our entertainment and for the military's recruitment and propaganda purposes. As it says on the 350.org website, we believe in a safe climate and a better future, a prosperous and equitable world built with the power of ordinary people, driven by renewable energy and rooted in justice. We in Veterans for Peace agree. And I'll end with words from Veterans for Peace's winter 2020 print newsletter when the climate crisis and militarism project was starting up. Quote, Getting the U.S. military to begin reducing its carbon boot print and redirecting our social, our tax dollars to social needs is a much needed project in the global struggle to save and enhance life on this planet. Our lives do indeed depend on it, unquote. The acceleration of global heating, extreme weather events, and warfare that we have experienced in the last three and a half years deepens our commitment. And now I'd like to show you some resources for the NOMAS campaign. This is the homepage of the Climate Crisis and Militarism Project, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen and used already. Here's our mission statement. And the materials here are in two sections, the take action section, which I'll go into more later, and the learn more section. We have a new section on military conflicts and climate. We also have a very useful section on our engagement in the UN COP process. For the last three years, we have been able to send a member of the climate crisis and militarism either in person to the COP meetings, or last year as a digital um, badged attendee. And we have write-ups of those three uh, COP sessions. So going back up to the take action section, 
I'll click on No Moss, where we have a lot of resources for you and more coming. So here is an explanation of the No Moss no Military Air Shows campaign. Here's where you can click to request a presentation similar to the one that you've seen today, but it can also be somewhat tailored to your group or your coalition. It's a great way to get things started as you build your coalition to protest a military air show. Here are interviews, videos, and articles to go more in depth, a sample op-ed that was published by Gary, uh, the case study, uh, which goes into more detail than Gary's able to do right now into what this coalition has been able to do and will continue to do in San Diego. And then at the bottom, the complete schedules for both the Air Force Thunderbirds military air shows and the Navy Blue Angels air shows. I'd also just like to mention that tonight I will be presenting to my friends, a group that I was very involved with in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we'll also have some veterans for peace at that meeting they are going to be protesting a smaller air show that's a combined military and civilian air show in Hillsboro. And that's the same weekend that this Blue Angels propaganda film will be shown in IMAX theaters. Um, if you're not able to protest a military air show for various reasons, you can also think about getting a group together to flyer and otherwise protest that Blue Angels propaganda film. Uh, we looked at a trailer yesterday, it's very shocking, and I'm sure the whole thing is a powerful piece of propaganda that will further encourage this idea that this is appropriate entertainment and fun for the whole family when it is nothing of the kind. Um, so from this point, I think we're ready to get into some questions and comments from all of you. And yes, I can share the link to the Blue Angels trailer. Thank you for that question. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, and thank you everyone who has put questions in the chat. Um, just to make sure we get to everyone, um, if you can just type your question into the chat, um, then I can read them out and um okay great so a few that we've gotten so far um we had one from mary who was asking um if someone could talk more about one of you could talk more about how the u.s military protects the petrol dollar um and put in quotes um or the lithium dollar for that matter does someone want to take that um i, I will say a little bit um about $80 million a year goes into uh, protecting the global uh, oil supply. Uh, <clears throat> heavy presence in, in the Middle East, Ecuador, uh, many other places. So, you know, as Gary mentioned, you know, early on, the great white fleet of Teddy Roosevelt, it was called, these 16 ships painted a bristling white that was really the start of protecting the, the global uh, fossil fuel supply. And when that started in 1907, it was coal and the Navy transitioned to oil in, in 1913 and has aggressively been defending the world's oil supply ever since. You know, as, as mentioned, there are heavy presence in the Middle East, Ecuador, many other places. And I think we could find <laughs> You know, the, the military, J.E. Sirach is a, is a senior military uh, army official, and he said climate change does not alter the army's mission to deploy, fight, and win. Well, you know, there's no such thing as sustainable dominance of this world, nor is there any way to seek justice within such a context. So that's that's what I say about it. Jim, Janet or Gary, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Um, so we had another, we had a, 
some back and forth in the chat about um, bases and the number of bases. Um, and so a lot of folks were jumping in and kind of sharing about why that's why that getting a, a solid number is challenging. Does do does one of you want to jump in more on that? Well, I'll start on that. We've had several rounds of base closures over the years, and the source we use is from David Vine, who who wrote a book called Base Nation. And it may be a little bit outdated, but, you know, if you've got 700 or 800 or 650, uh, you know, it, it's a gang if it's more than three, as I look at it. And we support them throughout the world. So, uh, you know, that could change on a daily basis. So we have, there are bases people don't know about. I mean, when they're, when service people were killed, in Somalia last year, people said, I didn't know we were in, we had military people in Somalia, but we do. So, you know, we, if somebody wants to challenge my 750, I'll gladly yield to that because it's, it's a malleable number. I'll just add quickly that the resource I dropped in the chat uh, that goes to David Vine's website is a deep wealth of information uh, with videos and photos as well as text. And I really recommend um, looking at his books as well. Thanks for sharing that, Janet. Um, so we had another question from Sharon. How do we inspire the shift away from the excitement created by the hyper patriotism and spectacle of the Blue Angels. I have a friend who is thoroughly enthralled with them. She's a single engine plane pilot and as a feminist gets really excited about women flying military planes. I don't feel I can even begin to approach the subject. Well, I'll, I'll start <laughs> and uh, then maybe my colleagues would like to jump in. Um, and I wanna start with a little anecdote of how I experienced the Hillsboro, Oregon air show last year. I was going to, I was living in that area at the time, and I went to my local Costco, which is next to the Hillsborough Airport, seeking to buy as much infant formula as I could, because last May there was, as some of you may remember, an acute shortage of infant formula in this country, and women were desperate, especially low-income women. So... As I was walking toward the store, there was this deafening roar overhead. I saw children squeezing their hands over their little ears. It was so painful. And I also saw people standing next to their vehicles in the parking lot, looking up entranced. I went into Costco and there was no infant formula. And I thought, well, if this doesn't just sum up where our country is right now, that air show, the military planes in that air show, were flown exclusively by women pilots. And at least one woman pilot is featured in this Blue Angels propaganda film. To begin to pick apart all the things that entrance people about military air shows, and beyond that, the military as a whole world, you have to find out what people care about and then how this relates to the waste of resources, money, time, and skills that military air shows represent. The US military is not a toy for our enjoyment. It is not a trivial and um, you know, piece of theater in the sky. It is a death machine. Getting people to realize that takes work and thought, and it doesn't happen quickly in many cases, but it is very necessary. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, nobody said it was gonna be easy. Uh, the task that we're faced with to get off fossil fuels has many components. And we've given about 150 of these talks in the past 
two and a half to three years. And as we engage people across the country, uh, we get a lot of reactions about, oh, I didn't know that the military did this, or mm -hmm. I didn't know that it cost so much money, or I didn't know that it had such a profound effect on the environment. But it's going to take effort on our part. And I know that uh, in my association with our local San Diego 350 people, uh, they're very interested in local issues and doing a good job on their local issues. And so what we're attempting to do is to broaden that awareness because the politicians are spending our tax dollars on this. And if nobody says anything, they'll think it's okay and everybody approves of it. So we do this, uh, I, I call the air show kind of the gateway drug into talking about the military's pollution and the military's spending of our tax dollars. So we have to start somewhere. And and I know in my association with 350 members um, and members of my family, you know, who have gone vegan and eat less meat, we have to make changes to our behaviors. And locally, we are making changes to reduce our carbon footprints. So what we're saying here is we demand the same from our institutions. The military is an institution. We are all in this together. It's all of us. It's our kids, our grandkids. We need to do something. And, you know, we used to kind of laugh when we would stand on a bridge and, and protest the air show, we would start out by just saying uh, stop endless wars or something fairly innocuous. And then we would get the peace sign and everybody honk horns and be happy. But when we switch to air show fuels climate crisis, that's a little more provocative. And it seems that some people forgot that the peace sign includes two fingers and would only give us one of those fingers for the peace sign. But that shows that we're you know, getting getting some people to become aware of this. And so I say we have to take the steps to do this. Who said it's going to be comfortable? I mean, is it going to be comfortable when you can't go outside because it's 125 degrees? Thanks, Gary. Okay, we've got a couple, a couple more questions. Um, so... There was um, one question from Art. Are there any examples where air shows were stopped in a community as a result of protesting? I I, I don't think so yet, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put up $50 for the first community that's able to do it. And uh, I have to say that uh, I was interviewed last year, the year, or the year before by our local PBS television station. And uh, I, I talked about why we're doing this. And then the air base sent out a public information officer. And in the clip, you can, you can hear the comment, well, the Marines admit that the air show pollutes a lot, but that's not the point, he said. Well, for us local people, that exactly is the point. The commanding officer refused to talk to us because he said it's a federal issue and it's not something that should be debated at the local level. Well, as my kids would say, I call BS on that because it's everybody's issue. Um, Taylor, I'm seeing a couple of great questions about... Um, corporations funding the military uh, in each state. Well, it's it's actually the military or the Pentagon budget that funds those corporations to make the weapon systems um, and many other things that they make. And um, also about big oil. And I'd just like to drop into the chat the link to the War Industry Resistors Network, which is a powerful allied uh, organization to us 
It's hosted on the World Beyond War website. And I think that's a great place to start uh, going for that kind of information. But I'll just make the obvious point that the US military is the biggest customer of Exxon, et cetera. Um, so that's a very direct way in which the military is um, keeping the fossil fuel industry going. I, I would like to add to that, uh, um, the corporate links for, uh, you know, um, I feel like the industry of war is actually more powerful than the Pentagon. And, uh, and the way that they kind of insert themselves into, into national and even international economies is, is really quite amazing. For example, the F-35 components for that plane are made in 47 of the 50 states. Now, this is not, it doesn't result in manufacturing efficiency, but it, it gets a few jobs, you know, reps in Congress can say, oh, we're getting jobs in our districts. And, you, you know, and also they get money in their campaign coffers. But, uh, you know, jobs, as Gary mentioned, the jobs are like healthcare, education, green energy. They are far better at creating jobs than the industry of war. Um, so there's, you know, there, there are examples of <laughs> the Pentagon wanting to get rid of uh, weapons that they have and, and, and then Congress lobbies to, to keep them. Eisenhower wanted to call, you know, he, he coined the term military industrial complex and he wanted to call it initially the military industrial congressional uh, complex. And he was persuaded to drop the last uh, congressional. Thanks, Jim. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions. So, um, and I think you were you were getting to, I think you were answering uh, Mary's question about how militarism employs people and makes communities economically dependent on the war machine. So if anyone wants to say more about that. And then there was also a question from Robin about the pollution of air shows. Um, and can like asking specifically, can you express or like translate that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you show me something here, please? I can't see where I put a note yourself. if I want to. Ask. George, mute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, the, can, can you express or translate that 120 metric tons per hour um, equals 120 metric tons of CO2 into something that like people can more easily? Maybe I should be mute here. A ton is like 113 gallons of, of fuel is one ton. Yeah, so, you know, maybe that's a little bit easier to uh, compute. You know, 113 gallons of fuel produces one ton of CO2 equivalent. Um, yeah, on the resources um, side, we'll be developing a handout that you can uh, pass out at protests or other actions um, and then also we will also, we will have a guide to how to protest a military air show that should be on the nomos webpage soon or you can contact me directly to get it I'll drop my um, I'll drop my email in the chat Thanks, Janet. Um, okay, so I know Alicia wanted to share another specific um, resource that might be helpful. Alicia, do you wanna jump in? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but um, I have been researching the connections between things that we think of as civilian industries and the war machine for a while. And I also have a bachelor's degree in environmental studies. And so I've been putting together with the nonprofit that I work with a workshop for people to basically like research in their local place. What are the things that have hidden connections to the military and the military industrial complex? And how do you make a long running campaign to stop those things or transform them into something more useful. 
So if any of you guys are interested in that, maybe if you don't have an air show near you, uh, please register for this. I'll, I'll put the link again here at it. Oh, uh, let me send that to everyone. Here it is again. Uh, but yeah, if you are interested in that, please register. Uh, I'm trying to get people to register by Friday so we can set up the times. It'll probably be three to four workshops done weekly, but that'll depend on uh, who registers and what time zones they are. So yeah, a lot of the questions that you all have been putting in here about like, how do we think about like the jobs argument of having say like a Raytheon plant in your backyard. Uh, those are things that mm -hmm. we can kind of like explore and figure out in a workshop like this. And, uh, you know, you can kind of like find the military industrial complex in universities, community colleges, laboratories. Uh, if you're on a border town, it can be the factory down the road. It can be in a, like a business development association in your town. It can be like the board members investments or their prior positions. It's really everywhere once you know how to look mm -hmm. for it. So yeah, uh, just wanted to let you guys know about that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank, you, thank so you so much, Alicia, for your work. And we're excited to do more with you. Um, I'd also like to thank people who've dropped so many great comments and resources in the chat. This is quite a well-informed audience. And remember, don't keep it to yourself. Letters to the editor, conversations with friends, house parties. May, may I have the last say, please? Um, and, uh, you know, in many other ways in which you can keep this urgent discussion of the intersection of militarism, war, and the climate crisis, and the larger ecological crisis spreading. And yeah, thank you again, folks. I'm seeing more uh, resources drop into the chat and I'm gonna check them out myself. Yes, thank you all so much. And I'm just gonna drop this one more time. Um, if you are, if you want to be, I know that a lot of folks have been putting it, if you're in this area, you wanna do this, like reach out to me. Um, that's great. We love people um, reaching out and coordinating individually. We're also happy to help kind of facilitate that. So please fill out this Google form and we will help connect you with folks um, who are who are also interested in protesting an air show in your area. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to say thank you again to all of our speakers um, and to our really engaged um, participants. Um, really, really appreciate everyone taking time out of their day. And we will follow up um, with a lot of these resources um, and the recording as well, so you can share it out. So thank you everyone so much.